Greetings, welcome to chapter six. We're gonna be talking about inference for categorical data in this chapter. So to start off with, we're gonna do a quick recap of everything you just finished reading because of course you've read the section prior to getting to this. And uh, of course you have watched all the course videos that gave you some information about this. So let's go take a look at it with respect to the textbook. We're gonna kind of just, this is a good spot if you haven't put all the stuff in your reference book already to get it out and let's get that stuff in there to help you out with the rest of this activity or this lab, okay? So um, we're first gonna look at inference for a single proportion. When we're working with categorical data, what we're going to be doing is basically using the binomial distribution. And what that means is we're going to be counting the number of successes. And we're going to see how many successes we got out of the entire um, sample. Okay. So we define a, a new sample statistic that we're going to use quite earnestly here. And that's called p hat. And what p hat is, is that's the sample proportion and it's defined to be x over n, where x is the number of successes, our good old friend from the binomial distribution, didn't change, okay, and n here, well that again is from the binomial distribution, that was the number of Bernoulli trials, so that's how many trials we took, okay, or the count of, of how many you actually did, and so the proportion of that's given by p hat is an estimate of the, the proportion of successes we would see in the entire population. So we're going to start off with inference for a single proportion. Well, how would we do that? Well, as it turns out, the binomial distribution is really well modeled by the normal distribution, provided that the sample size is large enough. So we will know that we can get a um, a normal distribution or a very close to being normal distribution. In other words, we can get a distribution that looks not quite unlike but similar to this of our p hats provided that certain criteria are met. Okay, well what, what are those criteria? We'll talk about those down here. We say well then you got to have first of all independence of observations and basically what that means is you need to have a simple random sample. I mean that's we've been talking about that pretty much throughout the course is that your 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 observations need to be randomly collected and they need to be independent of each other which means you can't take too much of the population and assume independence so that typically speaking for the things we're going to be doing with this this technique is not an issue provided that you're random but there's another criteria here and it says you're going to have to have 10 successes and 10 failures and what that means is that n times p has to be greater than or equal to 10 and then n times uh, 1 minus p, excuse me here, I make a little, quick little correction here, 1 minus p being the probability of failure, that also has to be greater than or equal to 10. And the reason for that is, is that we will lose this bell-shaped curve if we don't have that. All right, if we have the situation where um, your proportion, your p, is really close to zero or really close to one and your sample size is not very big. So in other words, if P is close to zero and your sample size is small, then the shape of the distribution of your sample proportions, this is a hat here by the way, P hat, the shape of those sample proportions is gonna be end up being skewed to the right because what's gonna happen is that your mean that you're trying to estimate of the true population proportion is going to be over here someplace. On the other hand, if your true population proportion, if that's somewhere close to one, in other words, if it's approaching one, then what's going to happen is that the shape of your distribution is going to be skewed to the left because the mean of the p hats is going to be someplace over to here. Now, these two shapes happen when your n times p is not greater than or equal to 10 and your n times 1 minus p is also again not greater than or equal to 10. But if you have met this is the success failure criteria, if you meet the success failure criteria, then the distribution of p hats will be approximately normally distributed with its center being at p, the true population proportion, and the standard error will be given by the probability of success times the probability of failure divided by the sample size, all of that square root of, okay? Um, 
this we'll just call a math miracle for the moment. If you're interested in the mathematics of where that came from, let me know and I'd be happy to explain that to you. Okay, so that's important stuff. So we, we when we go to use the techniques that we're going to be developing in this chapter, we always need to check the success failure criteria and make sure that indeed the sample size was large enough to be able to use the normal approximation. Okay, so let's go take a look at um, what we just said, kind of in recap, all right? So we make sure we know how this applies to when we're talking about a confidence interval and how this applies when we're doing a hypothesis test. Because notice this chapter is about inference for categorical data, which means confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, okay? So that both of these, in both cases, you need to have the success failure criteria needs to be met. And that means that there needs to be 10 expected successes and failures. Again, that means that N times P is greater than or equal to 10, and both have to be true, and that N times 1 minus P, the probability of failure, that also has to be greater than or equal to 10. Okay, so when you're calculating the standard error for a confidence interval, we're going to use the sample proportion to do that. In other words, the standard error for uh, confidence intervals will be calculated just as the standard um, error was for when we were working with means, we ended up using S instead of sigma. We had to use the estimated value. So same idea here. When we're working with confidence intervals, we will calculate our standard error using our estimated values. On the other hand, as we did when we were working with hypothesis tests for means, if we're going to be working with a hypothesis test, there will be a null value. There'll be a value given by the null hypotheses, and we'll use that value in the, of the null hypotheses in our calculation of the standard error. So that's a little bit tricky. You got to keep that in mind. It more or less is self-correcting. It'll, it'll make sense as you're doing it that you know that the standard error of um, and a hypothesis test is always the null value. All right, you're done. Okay, so what if we have the difference between two proportions? Now, this is very similar back in the last chapter. We had the difference between two means. In other words, what if we had p hat 1 minus p hat 2? L let's, let's go up here and state our null and our alternate that hopefully kind of make that make sense, a generic null and alternate, and then we'll talk about with respect to here, the null hypothesis would be something along the lines that P1 is equal to P2. Well, what that means is that the point estimate of that is going to be what? P1 minus P2 typically equal to zero. Now, in very rare cases, occasionally you will know or have inferred values for the null hypothesis of P1 and P2. And it might be in those cases that it's not equal to zero, but that, that's going to be pretty rare in a hypothesis test, okay? So the this difference between the population proportions, the point estimate or the best estimator of that is going to be given by p hat 1 minus p hat 2. So p hat 1 minus p hat 2 is going to be approximately, or our, our best guess, at what the two population proportions differences are going to be. So for example, say you have Republicans and Democrats, and you wanted to know how they both uh, fell, the proportion of Democrats, how they felt about the Supreme Court ruling on marriage equality versus um, Republicans, how what proportion of them felt in favor or in favor of the Supreme Court ruling on marriage equality. So the first proportion would be the proportion of Democrats in favor of marriage equality, and the second proportion would be proportion of Republicans in favor of marriage equality. So um, you can see where that becomes. Those are two independent uh, proportions. There are two independent populations that we are taking proportions from each of those. So now how do we go about creating confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for this difference between two proportions, okay? Well, the details are very much the same as before. So in all cases for, for, high, for confidence intervals, we're going to find some sort of a point estimate, plus or minus whatever the margin of error is. We're back to using z because we're using the normal distribution again. With respect to proportions, when we're working with proportions, p is always going to be using a normal distribution. We're not going to be using the t distribution when we're working with proportions. That's only for means. For means, we will be using um, the t distribution. And for proportions, we will be using the normal distribution, at least to start. Very similar pattern as when we're working with means. As it turns out that in the long run, um, the, the, the statistical community has landed on a more appropriate um, test statistic 
than the z-test statistic. It's called the chi-squared test statistic, but that's for next week. That's not for this week. So we'll, we'll worry about that next week. Enough of this. Okay, so anyway, so how do you calculate your z? Well, it's your point estimate minus your null value divided by the standard error, okay, to find your appropriate p-value. So we'll, we'll go through how to calculate that. And, and in many cases, the most difficult part, of course, of those, because the, the point estimate and the null value, those are pretty much going to be given to us. The null value is begin, being given to us by the null hypothesis. The um, point estimate, that's being given to us by our observation. So the bugger, of course, is how do we calculate the standard error. Well, the standard error between uh, two sample proportions turns out to be pretty straightforward. We just take the standard error from the first proportion and we add that to the standard error of the second proportion and then square root the whole thing. In other words, we basically take um, the variance for each of them, add those together, and then take the square root. And that should look really familiar because that's how we did it for two means also. We took the variance for each of the individual populations, added those together, and pooled that, is what we would say, and then took the square root of it. Now the problem, the fly in the ointment here, is comes back to that null hypothesis again that I said is very common, and that P1 is equal to P2, and that's all that's stated for the null. They don't give us a null value many times. They just say the two proportions are equal to each other. So how do we come up with the P1 here, and how do we come up with the P2 here to calculate our standard error? I mean, where do we get those values from? Well, we're going to have to cheat a little bit, just as we did when we were working with the means, where we, instead of using um, sigma, because we didn't know sigma, to calculate our standard error, we use the sample standard deviation. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use um, sample proportions to do that. But real quick, just a real quick reminder, as again, um, the uh, the the success failure criteria still holds for when we're working with um, hypothesis testing with two. But the problem again, one more time, is is where does this p come from for the null? Okay when we're working with the null hypothesis. In, in the case of confidence intervals, it's pretty straightforward because you're going to be given that value, the two values to subtract from each other from the two populations to create the confidence interval. But in case of the null hypothesis, it's not necessarily going to be easy to find this value of p naught. So how do we do it? So no more discussion. Let's talk about it. So we do what's called the pooled estimate of the proportion. So in the case when comparing two proportions, P1 equals P2, there isn't a value given in the null that we can use to calculate the expected number of successes and failures in each sample. Therefore, we need to first find a common or pooled proportion for the two groups and use that in our analysis. This simply means find the proportions of total successes divided by the total number of observations. So it really is actually pretty straightforward. You take x1, which is the number of successes from your first population, you take x2, number of successes from your second population, add those together, and divide them by the grand total of the number of observations, the number of observations from the first, or number of trials from the first population, number of trials from the second population. Now, make sure you're keeping this all straight because there's a definite difference in how we do this when we're working with a confidence interval versus we're working with a hypothesis test. Okay, so we're almost done. We're going to start working on a problem here. So uh, recap, comparing two proportions. So the population parameter is P1 minus P2. The point estimate when you're creating a confidence interval is going to be P1 hat minus P1 P2 hat. Conditions necessary to make this work, we know that we have to have independence within the groups, which means a random sample, and that we have less than 10% of the population for both groups. It means independence between the groups, there's no correlation between them, and at least 10 successes and failures is in each group, if not randomization. Uh, section 6.4, we're going to talk about that uh, later. That's There is a alternate method to this. Uh, we may or may not cover it. We'll see how the time goes, but there is an alternate way of doing it using the binomial distribution directly to go ahead and, and calculate these, these probabilities and proportions and such not. Okay, so um, again, standard error. We know how to do this. The P1 and the P2, it may be that we have to use um, the P hat pooled in the place of both of these. So when we're working with a hypothesis test, this p hat pooled goes in for everybody right here, and that's how you calculate your standard error, okay? Um, sometimes, like I said, p hat 1 and p hat 2 are used in place of that pooled value. That's very rare. That's only when they tell you 
that uh, it's not equal to zero for the two of them, but that's like, a, like in this slide, extremely rare. Okay, let's let's do a little bit of uh, comparison to the last chapter before we get into the example we're going to work. So standard error calculations. So we're working with means. Our point estimate is going to be x bar. And its job was to estimate the population parameter mu. If we are working with one sample and we want to have an estimate of the standard error of the sampling distribution of x bar, that's going to be s divided by the square root of n. If we have two samples, we take the variance from the first sample, divide that by n1, take the variance from the second sample, divide that by n2, take the square root of it, and that's the pooled estimate of the standard error. Okay, now notice that um, the standard error is a very sort of similar form for proportions. In the case of proportions, the point estimate is p hat. Its job is to estimate p, the population proportion. The standard error in this case is going to be given by the probability of success times the probability of failure divided by the number of samples, square root of that. And if uh, we have two, then we will use p1 and p2 respectively. Remember that p1 and p2, p1 and p2 are going to be estimated both by p hat pooled. Where the p hat pooled, we talked about that in just the last slide, just we'll go back here for just a second to take a look at that. The p hat pooled, that was simply take the number of successes from the first one, number of successes from the second one, add those together and divide by the grand total. Okay, that'll, when we get to the example of that one, we do that problem, it'll hopefully make more sense. Okay, so make sure all of that fun stuff is in your your conf, your um, reference book. Of course, uh, I know it's kind of fast. Just recap. I just want to make sure that you got this in here. It is all in the textbook, and um, the the videos, the YouTube videos that were back up in in the course content also discuss this. Okay. Alrighty then. So let's go take a look at uh, the first problem they're going to look at today in this lab, and that is. Let me scroll up here. I've already got my R markdown file going. We're looking at exercise 6.2 to actually start this off. Let me go ahead and knit it real quick so we can maybe get a better view of it here. Throw the HTML file up here. Okay, so this is lab seven. In this lab, we will work with several textbook exercises to get a better feel for how to do inference for categorical data. So in 6.2, we have young Americans part one, about 77% of adults, young adults, think they can achieve the American dream. It's right. Uh, two cars in your driveway, a chicken in every pot, and Fridays you get to go out for pizza and beer, right? So if the following statements are true or false, explain your reasoning, okay? So let's let's go back over here and we'll read them directly off of the um, R Markdown file. Okay, so first one is, it says, the distribution of sample portions of young Americans who think they can achieve the American dream in samples of size 20 is skewed left, okay? So is that true or is that false? Well, let's, let's go back to what we were just talking about a second ago with the success failure criteria. Let's get ourselves a, um, a clean whiteboard here. And the success cr uh, failure criteria tells us what? It tells us that n times p and n times 1 minus p, that it, both of those have to be greater than or equal to, to 10, right? So in this particular example, what they're saying is, is that we've got a, um, a sample size of 20. The population proportion is reported to be 77%. So the sampling distribution of p hat Will that be skewed to the left? Well, let's let's think about that, okay? So go back over here, shock and draw a little picture here. So let's see, what would n times p be? Well, that's gonna be 20 times 0.77, right? And so if you take a look at 20 times 0.77, that gets us 15.4. So let me put this in parentheses. So that's, that's, this is our n times p, and our n times p was equal to 15.4, and then our n times 1 minus p, that's going to be 20 times, well, let's see, that's going to be what, 0 0.23, correct? Yeah, I'm just checking my notes here, make sure I did my arithmetic in my head, right? And that's going to turn out to be approximately 3.6, okay? And so what we see here is that we have violated violate. <laughs> I spelled that right. I hope so. So we violated the success failure criteria. 
All right, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is this, is that the, the shape of the distribution of the p-hats that would come from this distribution would not be bell-shaped. Now, why is that? Well, let's think about this back in terms of the binomial for a minute. So you could have 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 all the way up to 20 successes, where all 20 out of the 20 said that they could meet the the American dream, okay? Well, what we're doing now is we're converting these binomial numbers, these values, random variable x, into number of successes into proportion of successes. So this is 0%, this is 1 20th, this is 2 20th, all the way up to 20 20th, okay? And so 77%, which is about 15.4 successes, is our expected mean value in this distribution, it's going to be somewhere about here. That's our 0.77. And so notice that this distribution will be centered over the top of that, and it will be skewed something like that, okay? In other words, it's going to have a left tail. It'll be left skewed. So what does that mean then? Well, that means that you shouldn't be, that's why they're telling you, don't use the normal approximation, warning, Will Robinson, warning. This is not going to work. You violated the success failure criteria. So if we go back to the question here real quick, it says um, the distribution of sample, excuse me, the sample distribution, sampling distribution will be, skewed to the left and that the answer here is yes this is true true the value uh, values excuse me of the success failure not df sf yeah, yeah, yeah. criteria are 15.4, oh, let's see, what was the other one? Come on, mouse, where did you go? <clears throat> Sorry about that. My, my pen decided to go for a walk on me here. And 3.6, so 15.4 and 3.6, respectfully. So we have 15.4 and 3.6. So the mean will be to the right and the tail will be to the left, which means it's going to be skewed left, okay? All right, let's go take a look at the next one. So the distribution of sample portions of young Americans who think they can achieve the American dream in random samples of size 40 is approximately normal since n is greater than or equal to 30. And remember, that's a little bit of LaTeX there. That's how you get a greater than or equal to to show up in your R markdown file. So put in the dollar sign, the forward slash GE for greater than, and then that. Okay, and uh, I'm going to, don't even need to go back to the whiteboard here. This is false. This is not the criteria that we're working with. Our success failure criteria is what we use to decide whether it's normal approximation, which means n times p and n times 1 minus p are both greater than or equal to 10. This, the greater than or equal to 30, that is the criteria for means. For sample means, not sample proportions. So, trying to mess with us and catch us on that one, okay? All right, so a random sample of 60 young Americans where 85% think they can achieve the American dream would be considered unusual, okay? All right, well, let's go back and remind ourselves how do we decide whether something is usual versus unusual? So we need to do what? Let's look at the Z-score. Z-scores are a great tool for deciding whether or not something is usual versus unusual. So let's go back over to the whiteboard. We'll go get ourselves a new whiteboard here. <clears throat> Let's see, I think I've got one more here. Yes, I do. We'll go ahead and make a nice clean one here. Okay, so let's see. What, what did they say again? Let's, let's get our numbers over here, transform over. They gave us this time that our sample size was 60, okay? And they want to know, would a sample proportion of 85% be unusual given that they're telling us that the population proportion P is equal to 77%, okay? 
All right, so back to the whiteboard and let's see what we can do with this. So what we know is that we know that z is equal to your observed value x minus your mean divided by your standard deviation. Like I said, this is the only formula I'm ever going to require you to memorize in this class. That's something you just really need to know is that it's a z-score gives you the number of standard deviations, or in the case we're working with a, a sampling distribution, the number of standard errors you are away from the population parameter. So in the case what we're working with right now, our point estimate x is going to be p hat. The mean of the distribution, whoops, I want an equals, I want a subtraction. The mean of the distribution is going to be equal to what? Well, it's p, right? The sampling distribution of p hat's mean is p, and that's going to be divided by the standard error. Well, what was the standard error? Well, the standard error is given by p times 1 minus p all over n. Okay, so now um, notice that we're using the population value for p both in the numerator and denominator here. So p is equal to 0.77. Our p hat is equal to 0.85. And if you recall correctly, I believe it was 60 was the size of our um, sample, right? So that's for 60 young Americans, okay? So if we come back over here and we do that actual calculation, that says that you're going to have 0.77. I'm going to write it as if you're entering it into R. So 0.77, oh, excuse me, not 0 0.77, 0 0.85. Put them in the right order, Mike. Jeez Louise, buddy. Still would, have, still would have been okay, I just would have got the wrong SIGN on there, okay? So 0.85 minus 0.77 divided by SQRT, and then you're going to use 0.77 again. 0.77 times 0.23 divided by our sample size, which is 60. Now I'll let you go ahead and do that, but when you enter that into... Um, R and go ahead and run that, I got back that that was approximately 1.47. So using our empirical rule, empirical rule said that basically anything that fell within approximately two standard deviations of the mean was not unusual. So this is less than two standard errors. And since this is less than two standard errors, remember standard error is the word or the name for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat. So standard error is a heck of a lot easier to say, so we just say that, okay? So that's less than two standard errors, so this is not unusual. So our answer in this case to the glorious question that they're asking us would be not unusual. So let's go ahead and enter in an R chunk here. I said I was going to do it, but I'll let you all go ahead and do it here. So let's see, what was our Z-score again? Well, our Z-score is going to be 0.85 minus 0.77 divided by SQRT of, shoot, I got 0.77 times 0.23 and divide that by n, which was 60. Okay, so if I go ahead and I run that chunk, that's where I got that number from, okay? And so we would say, nope, not unusual. All right, so uh, we should probably put something better than nope here. <laughs> Let's put false. There we go. Okay, a random sample of 120 Americans where 85% would be, oh, well, let's do it again. Okay, so this is basically the exact same problem. So I'm just going to cheat, copy this all from up here, bring it down here. It's not really cheating, it's just working smart instead of working hard. Of course, i got to get rid of my conclusion here because I don't know what that's going to be. But I'm changing only one number in here. I'm changing the sample size this time from uh, 60 to 120. So let's try it with, not 6,120, just 120. So let's go ahead and run that. And this time we get 2.08. So looking at the z-score again, it would say looks unusual because it's greater than 2, right? Remember, this is just a rule of thumb. This is not something that we, uh, we really, if we're serious about making a, an inference like this, we would probably do either a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. So it looks unusual. So 
true in this particular case. All right, well, that was a lot to digest in this video. Um, please take your time to write down all that stuff that we talked about in the beginning in your comp book. It's going to make the rest of these problems working a lot faster for you.